So if we're going to do a four-day course and then a week in the field on inventories, we should probably come to a good understanding of what an inventory is. Um, and at the, at the outset, it sounds pretty simple. You go out into the field and you, you make a list of or you make a collection of all the species that are there. But there's a lot of kind of loaded words in there. So if you look for inventory on Google, uh, you see a bunch of people walking around with data recorders. But notice that they are elaborating each item. Okay? I mean if you're if you're working at, let's say, a car dealership and the owner of the dealership says to you, you know, Rafe, I want an inventory of all the cars on the lot. You don't want to come back to him and say, well, we have between 90 and 100 cars. Right? Rather, he wants to know, make and model of every single one of those cars individually. So, an inventory is to make as complete a list of items, to make a complete list of items such as property, goods in stock, the contents of a building, or the species present at a site. Yeah, lay off me. Um, and that's a very important word right there, a complete list. Now those of you who have been out into the field, which I think is almost all of you, um, you know that that word complete is pretty hard. You know, we're going to go out and, you know, the bird people always say that plant work is easy, but, you know, the plant people have flowers that are 50 meters above them in the canopy. Um, or Moses studies some plants that seem to emerge like four weeks into the dry season, or, sorry, wet season, and then go away by the middle of the wet season and don't emerge until a year later. Um, and in fact, Moses is, you know, has described a bunch of new species, which clearly all the previous inventory efforts had missed. So, you know, we say make a complete list, but that's slightly wrong or slightly misleading. Now, on the other hand, sampling is the process of selecting units from a population of interest so that by studying the sample, we can generalize results back to the population. So this is some sort of approach to a world that's really complicated. And we can't do that full, exhaustive inventory. And instead, what we're doing is we're trying to tell you what the inventory would look like, okay? We don't know the complete list, and it may not be knowable, but we can guess about its qualities. And so that's a really important distinction. And it gets confusing right away because we're going to use sampling techniques in our effort to create an inventory. So, Again, inventory produces a complete catalog. Sampling characterizes a population that's too big or too complex to inventory. And the choice between these two worlds is really important because it really ends up driving some important characteristics of how we do the work. So, I'm disappointed at this example that I put together because it was meant to have Moses sitting here and be a conversation. And in fact, Moses has been the center of focused conversations in several of these courses. Uh, the most notable was in the, the Ghana course where he had put together a data set. And one of the instructors had a long discussion with him and they decided to take a half of an entire day of the course and it was just the instructor and Moses in a conversation about the data set. It was really neat. So this was going to be that again, but Moses can't be here. So here goes an example. And this is this 
tension, and it is a tension between inventorying and sampling. Moses' dis doctoral dissertation will be in some sense a study of the plants of the Cameroon Mountains, the higher parts of the Cameroon Mountains. And you know, ideally, he would study, you know, the data that go into his dissertation would be a series of inventories at sites across Cameroon and, and slightly into Nigeria. So he's interested in developing an inventory, but we're going to focus just on the Rumpi Hills. And in fact, you all will be with us for this week and next week. But then at the end of next week, when you all go home, um, Moses and the instructors and a, a, a couple of Cameroonian assistants will continue on to Rumpi Hills, where we're going to spend two glorious weeks at 1,600 meters in the Cameroon Mountains. As Mark said earlier, it's a lifetime dream for some of us who've been staring at this, this very small point on the map for decades. Um, so Moses, this is a really imp important element in his dissertation. It's basically one big data point. Uh, and in fact, he went last week and did eight hectares of sampling at lower elevations in the Rumpi Hills. We'll be continuing for two weeks at middle elevations, and then I think he's planning to go back one more time. And again, what he really wants is an inventory. And he's put a lot of time into, okay, how do I design my field work to get closest to what I'm really trying to get, or what he's really trying to get? So via a colleague, he obtained some base maps. Uh, this is the Rumpi Hills, okay? And it's essentially a highland arc that's in a little, a little uh, sideways U shape. Uh, this valley is really, really interesting. It's a lowland valley that's encircled by this, this highland area. Uh, it's apparently completely off limits logistically. We're going to drive, we hope, to Dikome Balue, which is right here. Apparently this is not exactly the nicest road in existence. And we're hoping to go beyond Dikome Balue to a site right there where we will set a camp. Um, and then these red tri triangles are the villages in the region. And the blue and purple areas are different vegetation covers within the Rumpi Hills um, protected area or somewhat protected area. And then these green circles are the sites that Moses is intending to sample. Sorry, study. Got to be careful. Inventory, sample, what are we talking about? Um, and the different shades are these different vegetation types. So he'll talk about stratifying his study, which is to say he's wanting to put this number of sampling points, study points, in each of the vegetation types. Let's go a little deeper into this. His field work his data accumulation. Notice I'm avoiding sampling and inventory. Um, his field work focuses at a suite of points. He's done eight. I think he's hoping to do 20 total at this region. And within those points, which are actually a little polygon, and we had a long discussion about how do you sample a hectare? And apparently what he's done forever at Corup is plots of 100 by 100 meters. But finding a 100 meter square that's relatively consistent and accessible in a montane system is very different. So at the previous course in January in Uganda, uh, especially with another of the instructors, there was a long discussion about 
what are the relative merits of a square plot versus a rectangular plot? And so in a rectangular plot, you can, you can select, for, for example, along a trail such that you stay at a more consistent elevation. And so it appears that he's going to use rectangular plots, each of which is, what, 200 by, sorry, 50 by 200 meters in size and therefore samples a, uh, a hectare. And the plots are situated fairly randomly. He had to make some areas off limits because they're inaccessible. Um, but they're stratified so as to cover each of the major vegetation types. You might have a vegetation type that has a very small extent but nonetheless has a very different flora and you want to make sure you sample that and a purely random design might miss that vegetation type entirely. Sorry. So, those points, those sampling or, or the study areas, they really s cover a very small proportion of the Rumpy Hills. And you all know that we're not talking about a uniform universe of, that, we're, that we're studying. There are rock outcrops and there are deep valleys and there are you know, microhabitats. And you all know that sometimes you'll find a certain species associated with a certain microhabitat. So he's got these points that were basically cast on the map in a GIS. That may not be the best way to characterize the flora of the Rumpy Hills. You know, here's that same protected area, just the light's not good enough to get you the, the detail, but with better light you can see some deep valleys and some real um, very different parts of the topography. So again, these microhabitats and this topographic variation, there might even be differences in soil or uh, you know, what have you, those are not necessarily going to be sampled well, covered well, studied well, characterized well by a pure random design. And the other thing is, some species are just sparse. They may not be focused on a particular microhabitat. They may just be present in low numbers. And so if you say, okay, I'm going to study this particular plot, and now I'm going to go over here and this particular plot, you may walk by the one individual of that species that's at all detectable. So there's a real, there's a real two-edged sword of doing these, these very nice sampling plots where you can get other information, and we'll talk about that in a moment, versus just using every tool available to characterize the whole flora or fauna. And this, this same set of comments applies to the bird world because we have, I don't do this stuff, but ornithology has this whole custom of doing point counts. And the idea is you go to a place that maybe you chose at random on a map and there's some radius, what is it, 20 meters or 50 meters? 250, depending on the habitat. 250 meters in the Rumpy Hills would be a pretty long diameter. But some set radius, and you go there and you spend some set amount of time, maybe 10 minutes, and your job is to detect everything within that circle, every bird within that circle. Of course, some birds you can't detect beyond 10 or 20 meters, and other birds, you could see them a, you know, a kilometer away. But we do this same thing of, I want to say sampling, and I will say sampling this time. We go to a point and we collect data. And then we go to the next point and we collect data. And it's a real two-edged sword. For these two reasons, 
that may not be the best route to a full inventory. I would argue that that plot-based approach to inventory is actually more in line with sampling. Because you're saying this flora or this fauna is so big that I can't really get the full inventory and so instead I'm going to use a sampling process so that I can guess at the final at least number of species. In this case it's you know 90 or 100 cars on the lot. But we the biodiversity scientists, all of us, we may want that exact number and more importantly we may not want the number but we want the list of the identities of each species and that's more of an inventory process. So that might be a different way of inventorying the Rumpy Hills. And I really wanted to see Moses' face when he saw that slide because he'd be like, oh town, you can't do that. You're gonna kill me with this project, right? But sometimes you have to sacrifice on one end to get another end. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that tropical botany revise its methodology just because I'm making this suggestion. But what Moses will get out of those plots is things like age structure and abundance. And that can be very important. You know, you can have a forest that looks beautiful that has no reproduction happening. They are the living dead, right? Um, and when you have that, you learn a lot about the future of that ecosystem. You know, maybe there is a, a grazer that's eating all of the seeds or killing all the saplings such that the forest literally does not reproduce. So that's good information, but it's ecological information and it's not related to the inventory. And that it, abundance information is also very important but it's not related to the inventory. Remember, the inventory is that definitive, complete list. So, again, I'm not, I'm not arguing, I, I will argue with Moses about this just for the fun of argument and debate. I'm not going to say, you know, unless you do a, you know, a real inventory, it's all, you know, garbage. But what I will say is that there are costs and benefits to using sampling tools to do an inventory. And so an alternative approach might be literally to traverse every accessible part of this and for a botanist like Moses to walk through the forest and say, yeah, I've already seen that, yeah, I know what that is, oh, I don't know what this is, clip, specimen, notes, data, okay, know what that is, know what that is, and, and writing it down, and probably given that this is a pretty remote site and hasn't seen a lot of work, maybe what he does is the first of each species he collects, and then after that he's able to say, no, I know what that is, I know what that is, I know what that is, or maybe he collects a series of ten individuals from each species, but after you've recorded a species, you don't worry so much about getting information that is not taking you to the inventory. You know? And you'll see the bird guys and the herp guys doing these same distractions. If all we wanted was the inventory, maybe you just take one specimen. But of course, we're thinking also about evolutionary studies or describing a new species that turns out not to be what we thought it was. And so we'll always want a series of specimens. And in some senses, we could work faster by just writing down the species if we're sure of it. Okay? So there's always this, this cost and benefit and these distractions. You know, we may come across some very rare species where its voice isn't known. And even though we know what the species is, we may nonetheless 
spend a lot of time getting a recording of it because that adds to the overall knowledge of the species. But there's a, a very good argument to make that using sampling tools is a bad idea. And so you'll see the herpetologists walking and you know, moving leaf litter, and you'll see the herpetologists wading through streams, and you'll see them, are you guys gonna do pitfall traps or do you not do that? Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of work and a lot of time that it takes. Um, and you'll see them going out at night and looking for nocturnal species. They'll put traps on arboreal habitats. I mean, just all sorts of stuff. With birds, we'll do auditory surveys, we'll do visual surveys, and we use mist nets, okay? If you go into entomology, it's a total nightmare because each group has its own little requirements. But my point is, believing in one approach, you know, like you could, in theory, work towards a, bir a bird in inventory using just mist nets. And it would be really nice because then you could measure something related to abundance as number of birds per mist net hour. But we know very well that mist nets sample the bottom few meters of a forest and not everything above that. And even not, not very well the things that run on the ground. So many times what is a better idea if you're working towards an inventory is multiple techniques, essentially using all of your knowledge of the group to get you that complete list. So I'll apologize to Moses later about, about speaking of him in his absence. Um, but the very general umbrella questions and ideas about inventories are you really need to choose the objectives carefully. Is it that gold standard list of all species present in the place? Is it a list of the dominant species? Is it a rapid first pass list? Or does it have ancillary information like specimens or like um, abundance information or age structure? You need to design a methodology specifically to be able to maximize progress towards that objective. And so as I just mentioned, if the list, if the objective is the list of all species, then you really have to orient all of your activities towards detecting each species present and moving on to the next one. Because inventories are always in places that are pretty costly to get to. You need to document the inventory deeply and carefully. And to every extent possible, you need to minimize those distractions of other data. Now, obviously, sometimes those distractions then become the ingredients in the species description, or they enrich the basic inventory but you've already decided on what is your objective. And so anything that is not stated in the objective, you really need to keep to a minimum. Okay, just to sum up, sampling and inventory are different, although we may use sampling tools to get to our inventory. They demand very different methodologies and very different interpretations. I'm afraid that many in the biodiversity community do not distinguish between these two things, and they'll use sampling-based tools to think about inventories, or they'll say that they're doing an inventory when they're really sampling. Sampling really must be reserved for situations where what you're trying to characterize is too complex or too big to inventory. And really the goal should be an inventory because that ends up being something that is very useful in the longer term. And we'll talk about that more in, in future talks. 
Any questions about these ideas that I've just thrown out? <laughs>